Um, thank you so, so much. And um, first and foremost, how are you all keeping? Are you all well? Good. It's really good. Um, it, it's really good to um, be here, to be honest. And um, it, it's really funny. When, when you do these things, one of the things that's really interesting is like the first question I'm always asked is, do you have any slides? Do you have anything you prepared anything? And um, I mean, probably part of it is a little bit experience, but the bigger part of it is that um, in a previous life, I was a PE teacher. And um, one of the things that was always really interesting with that kind of life is that you prepare these lessons, these amazing lessons. Then after lunchtime, everyone comes in and you know, you've got kids wired, pupils wired, and you're like, this plan is not gonna work. You're gonna have to change on the spot. And very often when you're talking about issues around race, decolonizing the intersection, generally speaking, one of the things you actually never know is who you're gonna be speaking to. So you're invited to speak to places, but you have no idea who you're going to be talking to. So in a lot of cases, you have to be adaptable to the situation. So, you know, you have a conference like this, but I wouldn't know who would be here. So a lot of the time you're kind of getting a feel for what's happening and then you're kind of responding or being agile to that particular situation. So um, a lot of it's kind of running through thoughts, but hopefully it'll, it'll correlate and make some sort of coherent sense. Um, so I guess the easiest thing is always the hook. So, um, you know, I think in terms of legendary one hit wonders, we've got Dream, and um, Dream's legendary one hit was things can only get better. And I guess it became the, the soundtrack to, you know, new labor, labor firebrand in terms of Tony Blair, et cetera, et cetera. And what's really interesting with this idea is that you have this kind of space that's been changed, you know, in terms of galvanizing a whole new focus in terms of how people think. When we kind of think about, um, I guess, race and higher education, what's happened in the last five years is quite remarkable um, to give, to kind of provide some context. So we're seeing, you know, we've seen a huge increase in kind of the numbers of black and ethnic minority students going on to postgraduate study through lots of different schemes um, that have happened. Um, Dr. Um, Bandina Wudu has been huge in that, leading roots, um, Paulette Williams and Dr. Chantal Lewis have been huge in that. There's been a lot of mechanisms around that. Um, the Broken um, Pipeline Leading Roots Report, which led to eight million pound funding competition from government um, to the OFS. So there's been a lot of kind of advancements, but what has kind of perforated those advancements in that time are kind of little fads that have happened in that time and probably the biggest fad that's happened is, is decolonizing and the reason why I, I i say that because that particular term has been franchised and it's been packaged really really well and it's kind of happened within the storm the eye of a storm of of what happened with george floyd so I always think kind of pre-George Floyd and post-George Floyd. So my big thing is what were institutions doing before that period of time? So before the pandemic, what, what were they doing? And what becomes really evident is actually institutions weren't doing a lot. Now, I, I say this not from a position of um, absolute defiance, but I've been fortunate to do a lot of consultancy, work a lot of institutions, and that infrastructure wasn't interwoven within the fabric of those institutions. So it's something that in many respects was reactive to what had happened as a result of George Floyd. Now, why is that important? That's important because then the labor of that work, thinking about where that labor sits becomes really interesting. So you have black and ethnic minority people that are exploited in many respects, um, have labor unremunerated and it isn't aligned within any kind of career trajectory so you have these kind of narrow confines of what we deem to be academic excellence in terms of being promoted and also within professional services what we deem to be professional service excellence and that gets narrower and narrower and narrower and what doesn't fall within that parameter is citizenship and particularly the type of citizenship that scholars and professional staff of color always found themselves are always found to have to be doing. And when I say to have to be doing, there is an element of there is an element of autonomy very often in those situations. Um, and so that makes it quite quite difficult in terms of doing this work. So understanding that franchise term is really, really interesting. Now the the, the franchising of it, I guess, is this idea of decolonizing, you know, decolonize 
STEM, decolonize sociology, decolonize anthropology, decolonize all of these things, decolonize English literature. And I always kind of think, um, what, what exactly are we decolonizing? Um, and the reason why I think that um, is because in the first instance, you're asking people to run before they can crawl or walk. So in the first instance, what is colonizing? And how are these con constructs that surround us across every academic discipline, how are they colonized? What is the history of that colonization? And upon understanding that, then you can kind of graduate to, you know, walking, running or jogging, running. But what we've done is completely accelerate straight to decolonize. And I'm yet to meet a person who can define to me what decolonizing means because people do it one in such different ways and, in, and, and one in a way that actually doesn't, it's not actually sustainable. If anything, most of the decolonizing processes that exist in, in of the last two or three years have actually caused more harm to black and ethnic minority people because they find themselves at the sharper end having to mobilize those interventions at a cost to their own physical and mental well-being also without the professional recognition for doing that as well and it being valued as professional currency so in terms of the idea of decolonizing and in relation to i guess a subject area and look i'm 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 no stem person so i sit on an appg for stem and diversity but i'm not a stem person so i don't speak to things i don't understand but i do have some understanding of some of the practices that have existed within stem that have marginalized or exploited black and ethnic minority people. And one of the things that I would kind of really say is, um, I guess in the social sciences, there's always been this idea that there's a flexibility to be able to change things. It's a lot easier to do than in STEM subjects. But what I would kind of implore us to really think about is, what are the incremental changes that we can make in STEM subjects? And also to question, why are those notions of absolute truth so fixed? particularly in STEM, and I'm, I'm saying this as the, the soft social scientist um, who basically is taught to challenge everything and to kind of make ideas, concepts, social constructions malleable for people to understand. And that's kind of part of the sociological imagination. Now, while you can't apply that to a STEM context, what you can do is really challenge why are these taking for granted assumptions? Why don't we challenge them? And why are they like that? So, for example, I think there's a complacency that sits in with a lot of these discussions. Um, so when we talk about decolonizing, it's something as, I don't know, as hollow as let's change the reading list. You know, cha changing the reading list isn't ultimately going to make a huge amount of difference. It's really about the language, the vernacular we use, is about how we engage with particular concepts, is about the types of people we have talking about those kinds of areas. And probably more importantly than that, it's about doing something that is not reactionary, it's about doing something that's sustainable. So I guess the question is, what would sustainable decolonization look like, as opposed to decolonization for the time? So at the moment we pivot you know, society, generally speaking, um, you know, race is, is political and whatever the politics of the time will dictate how we address race and racism. So, for example, racism has spent an inordinate amount of time, at least in my 37 years of life, sitting on the political periphery. And for about 15 to 18 months, it was in the political center. It was in a political center. And that political center came as a result of an incident that happened in America, which, to be quite honest, happens quite frequently. It just so happened that that particular one was caught on camera. But actually, if we think of Rodney King, if we think of many other examples, there are many exa other examples also within Britain of people being murdered on camera. That one caught fire because we was in this global state of paralysis where we had no choice but to actually ingest what was happening. Whereas in a normal world, what we tend to have, by and large, is disposable empathy. So we can look at something on TV through the news, we can digest it, and ultimately we can say, that's really sad. But ultimately, something will replace that news in a bit. So if we take, for example, what happened 
um, I think on Wednesday at the O2, Brixton Academy, with the crushing incident and sadly someone passing away, there's a, there's a feeling of, of sadness that a life has been lost, but actually the next piece of news will come and, 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 and life moves on. In a similar way when now when people see what's happening in Ukraine, there's almost, there's, there's almost a familiarity with that, which means that people don't have the same sense of feeling they had in, in February. And that disposable empathy becomes hugely important when we're talking about issues of race, because what ends up happening actually ends up becoming a rearguard action to it. And, and, and in some respects, it becomes a bit of a, a backlash. People get fed up of hearing about that and actually think, actually, do you know what? What more do you lot want? <laughs> you know, we've spoken about race, we've changed a few things, we've acknowledged it's a problem, like enough, like everything isn't to do with race. And what you end up getting is actually this visceral towards it. So you have these kind of situations and they play out in different sects of society. And I guess within kind of a subject discipline perspective, it's really thinking about, right, how do I create something fundamentally that is going to challenge the colonized aspects of what it is that we do? Because until we do that, that colonizing bit, which is the actual more difficult bit than the decolonizing bit is almost redundant. It's almost redundant because there are a lot of kind of safe tags you can put on that so you we can turn around and say we decolonize our reading lists we use different images of people during presentations um when we're kind of in our labs we use different experimental processes that also take into consideration people of color by the way all of which is good but actually the probably more important reason is why are we doing it because there are going to be students who are going to question, why are we doing this? This might not be something I might necessarily experience in my professional career in STEM. So why are we doing these things? And that's the colonizing bit. That's the bit where we then have to think about how we explain why things have been like this in the first place and how we're trying to reorientate these ways of thinking to consider actually why things have been done in this way, why it's problematic, and who historically it's affected. And that's a completely different narrative and a different body of work, which is a lot more difficult because it requires a real challenging of values and belief systems and the challenging of the normativities of what we deem to be absolute knowledge than actually just saying, I've changed this, this, and this. While that is notable, they are tick box exercises you know, um, they are tick box exercise. And I guess in this evolution of decolonizing through this idea of franchising, even that as a concept is now probably quite old, you know, and we're talking like a year ago, it was a really good thing to do. But it, it because the terms become franchised, it, it doesn't actually have any, how do I say it, it doesn't actually have any firm roots. You know, it, it, it's a tree that can be quite easily moved. And that's, and that's the problem. And I think part of that is because we're building on toxic soil. So this idea of building on toxic soil, if you build on toxic soil, you don't really have firm roots. What you have is things that may bloom, but ultimately they will eventually die. Whereas if you build on fertile soil, then that tree has really firm roots in terms of, okay, these are the roots of colonization. This is what's happened historically. This was the problem. This is what we need to try and address. And then the practical solutions come from how we then begin to think about what could we do to address these problems, acknowledge these problems, address them, and then think about what decolonizing would mean in a 21st multicultural global society. And that is uniquely different. And I guess with the advances in science, engineering, technology, all of those things, our approaches towards this have to be more sophisticated in terms of having that alignment to the past and i think the the irony with decolonizing is that there is supposed to be that close alignment and affiliation with the past but interestingly a lot of our decolonizing is future facing but to, to address the problems of colonize of decolonizing you actually have to tackle what is a really difficult murky um sticky wicket in some respects in terms of thinking about 
those that colonial hangover and that colonial hangover very much permeates everything that we do so i guess the thing that becomes really important is is this idea of tacit learning so breathing for example is something you do getting up in the morning there's this tacit behaviors we have and almost what you want this to become is a reflex so a reflex in terms of right I don't think when I think of decolonizing, I don't necessarily think decolonizing, I think actually colonizing. What is the colonizing aspect? That is the reflex part. And then the bit, the stimuli that comes from the reflex is decolonizing. So this is the colonized part. This is the problem. This was the problem. And it still is a problem in, in, in kind of various iterations. And then the decolonizing is the is a stimulus, right? But this is what we need to do to solve that. So at the moment, we sit within this kind of binary of um, let's decolonize, talk about decolonizing, but we actually have no understanding of what the problem is. And I include myself in that as well. Um, so I'm, I'm not above um, that in any way, shape or form. Um, because, and it's only through kind of really thinking about it over the last three years that I've thought, Actually, I mean, yeah, you can make an argument. I should know better. But um, I thought to myself, actually, I, there's, a, there's a lot of this I, I don't really understand. So it's all well and good telling people or having conversations about what you've got to do to do things better. But we don't even understand what things were wrong in the first place. So that, that in itself is, you know, is, is deeply humbling. <laughs> if nothing else and I don't have an ego but it definitely strips away the little ego I did have because I was thinking okay right it's, it's really not as straightforward as that and that becomes kind of really interesting and I remember talking to my my mum about this and she was like well that's that's common sense Jason like I don't understand how you thought you could just decolonize without thinking about the colonizing aspect and I was like well, I've been doing this for like a couple of years. Why are you only mentioning it now? And, um, <laughs> and she was like, well, it's because it, it's common sense. But she also followed that by saying if common sense uh, was common and everyone would have it. So, um, I mean, it's it's one of those things that it's just, it's, it's interesting when we think about how these things work um, and, and how often, you know, it's, it's really funny. I was paying for something yesterday and it had four steps. So it said kind of like details, then write the message, then pay, then the payment for card, and then confirmation. And when I kind of think of decolonizing, we 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 don't really do steps one, two, and three. We just go straight to confirmation, and the confirmation that we want is for people to say your institution is doing an amazing job with decolonizing. Because also, there's that really interesting thing with decolonizing where you know your right hand always shows what your left hand is doing so when we decolonize really well we put it on twitter we put it on all our outward facing comms and we get everyone to see that we're doing this really fantastic work on decolonizing and then we couch it in this idea of best practice and and it, and it looks fantastic you know um but when you ask the people who are actually doing it inside what's your view on how things are going they're like well it's it's not great jason um it's actually really difficult um the victory is the universities to share when it goes well but is ours to own when when we fail and that's and that is a general consensus and it's a really difficult thing when you hear people kind of talking in those ways and also the kind of veneer the polished veneer of of decolonizing you know which in many respects let's be absolutely honest it becomes quite performative you can perform decolonizing. You can perform that. Now, who are the people that are, who, who ends up being at the sharper end of that performance? It's, it's people of color who continue to be at the sharper end of that and continue to suffer even more. And actually that defeats the whole purpose of decolonizing if the purpose is to have a, you know, break away from colonial practices and create something in many respects that's more equal, more equitable, racially non-ascriptive and recognizes the problems of the past. So we have this kind of construct of decolonizing, which absolutely contradicts all of the egalitarian ideals that we embrace in terms of wanting people of color to really have some ownership and some autonomy and some agency 
in the curriculum that they engage with, whatever subject discipline it may be. And, you know, one of the things that's always really um, funny about doing these things is that, um, you know, I mean, look, I don't think I'm the most hardcore person going, right? But like, um, I always think, you know, sometimes you look around and you think, oh man, I mean, I, I, I remember once someone saying to me like, you know, this is, this is really hard to hear, Jason. You know, it's really hard to hear. And I was like, you think it's hard to hear? You stand here and try and say it. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> it's a lot harder because there's so many things that you're thinking of. And I, and I explained to them, it's like live TV. Live TV isn't live. It's like a two minute delay, you know? And for people of color, when they're talking about these issues, there's always a delay from what you actually want to say and what you can say. And, and that, in many respects, is stifling. Now, when you think of this idea of like speech and how we use and abuse speech as human beings, the idea that even talking about something like this, you've got to be really careful what you say, you've got to be mindful of the consequences, you've got to you understand that there's a ripple effect, there's a responsibility to say the right things at the right time in real time. Because, you know, if I say something wrong now, I, I can't get that, I can't get that back. I can't put it back in my mouth, I've said it. And, and that is even in itself, you know, if we're gonna be really candid about decolonizing, you know, if I was to say like, you know, have we made advancements? Yes. If I was to say them in a percentage, I'd say probably less than 10%. If I was to say, are people of color suffering more now than they were five years ago? I'd say they are because racism in of itself is becoming more sophisticated, which means that the more overt forms of racism that we gravitate towards within our sector um, are not as obvious. That there is a, there's, a, there's a covert nature of racism now that is actually more sophisticated, which means that we have to be more hypervigilant to that. And in some respects, what that ends up being in, in reality is this idea of pivoting on the spot. So we started off with this idea of what it was like being a PE teacher. Um, the easiest, one of the best things to teach in PE was netball. It was a great leveler. To, all, all, all boys wanted to do was play football and netball was always my go-to sport. And the reason why it's a, it's a useful metaphor for this is because people of color doing decolonizing work are very much in a situation where they have to stay on one in one spot. So in netball, you pivot, you can't move with the ball, so you pivot. But fundamentally, you're a person of color and very often you're pivoting in racism. You can't actually move from the same spot. You're pivoting. You spend all of your time pivoting from one reaction to the next. And it goes back to this idea of what Malcolm X said many uh, moons ago, which is that racism is like a new Cadillac. A new model comes out every year. And I guess the only thing you can do is be reactive to racism. So you can never get ahead of racism because it is so sophisticated that in many respects, it reinvents itself in a chameleon like way all the time. But what you can do is be, be within a heel tap of it. So it's just before to get, it's just about to get to the try line, you can be within a heel tap of it. And that's about as good as you can do. And if you can get close enough to do that, that's, a, that, that's winning in decolonizing or racialized terms. But one of the things that I would say, you know, and it was a really good question to begin with, this idea of kind of decolonization and diversification. Are they kind of close siblings or close cousins or are they mutually exclusive? It's not really for me to say that, but I guess the thing that's kind of really interesting, again, decolonization, diversification, diversification is also the franchise word. You know, if we, if we go back to the lineage of these franchise terms over the last decade, start off with inclusion, then it went to diversity and diversification, and now it's decolonization. I don't know what the next one will be, but we'll, we'll wait for the next episode and we'll find out. But like, it's just interesting how we graduate through these particular terms and actually how none of them really serve to improve the intersection. So they have, they have the intention of trying to improve the intersection, but actually in reality, the praxis element, so in theory they work, in theory, these are great words. The praxis element is the practical application of that. So you've got the theory of it and the practical application of it. The practical application of it doesn't work. And I guess that's the bit that we need to think about. And the idea of things getting better is that actually we're having more of these types of conversations, which is making people more cognizant of the types of things they think about when they are actually engaging 
in decolonizing. Now, the thing that I would say is, is, is if we can move away from that idea, because in some respects, decolonizing is a notion. It's a notion because it isn't fixed. And it's a notion because actually no two people practice it in the same way. So people have different beliefs. And part of that will also be people's lived experiences. Their lived experiences, particularly people of color doing this work, will determine how they engage with that. So me as a black male, I unfairly have privilege over black women and women of color more generally speaking. So recognizing the dynamics of that in doing the colonizing work is very, very important because if you don't recognize that, then you, know, you can actually play out to particular types of dominant hegemonies that actually will further subjugate women of color and continue to disadvantage them further. So understanding that, and that's me as a black, as a black man. So if we think about that from the perspective of being a white person or a white ally or someone that's an anti-racist um, ally, then there are even more things to kind of think about, given that the proxy of this whole issue is situated in ideas that really pedal and revolve around white supremacy. So disrupting that and kind of disaggregating all of that and situated within the idea of whiteness becomes hugely important. And, you know, I guess how that kind of works across different kind of academic discipline lines is hugely important and look i don't have all the answers i i definitely don't know anything um the one thing i i do know about um is i know i got a lot of useless knowledge but it's got nothing that will benefit any of you but um the thing that i would say is that um and, and catherine mentioned it earlier there is a humility that comes with doing this work um and even and even myself i would have it and i i am positioned as an expert and i if any talk i've ever done i always make a point to say to people i'm not i mean you're only setting yourself up for disappointment if you go around telling people you're an expert um so i don't do that um but what i i would say is that it does need to be a really diligent challenging of actually what decolonizing means and actually if you remove the de it's this idea of colonizing the colonizing aspect that's the, that's the A bit, you know, to get to B, we have to do the colonizing bit. What is the colonizing bit that's happened? And once we understand that, everything we do then becomes on the front foot. It becomes on the front foot. You go from, you go from hitting the tennis ball in the middle of the court to hitting for the lines. And hitting for the lines really means you're attacking, you're really attacking your opponent. If you've got the ball set up in the middle of the court, you leave yourself wide open to be smashed around the court. If you're actually taking your opponent to the lines, that for me is how you decolonize. You're attacking that. At the moment, what we're doing is getting the ball back in the court in terms of decolonizing. That's what we're doing. You know, I would rather miss the court by a foot trying to be more attacking than actually try and play safe inside the lines. And I think that's a really, really important thing. And the one thing that I would leave you with is um, feet first, head second. So feet first represents culture and head second represents strategy. Strategy is what we always use to get our way out of doing things around race. It's impossible to strategize anything without having the culture in place. So if you have, a culture that revolves around toxicity, exploitation, and causing further harm to black and ethnic minority people, then ultimately that, that culture is not going to, whatever strategy you put in place is not going to succeed. Whereas if you put the culture first and you think about what that looks like and how we kind of improve that culture in a slipnical way that kind of really represents people's lived experience, how they engage in this work, places them in a safe environment, in a safe culture for them to truly express themselves, then you can, then the strategy stands up upon what is a really solid basis in terms of culture. Without that, it becomes hugely difficult. Um, it's been an incredible year, um, an incredible 12 months. I'm sure none of us will ever forget, three prime ministers, uh, <laughs> amongst many other things. Um, but listen, it, it's, it's an absolute privilege to be here. 
Um, I really, really appreciate all your time. It's not lost on me um, how lucky I am to be in this situation. Given that seven years ago, I was stacking shelves at Sainsbury's on a night shift. So um, yeah, to be stood here in front of amazing people like yourself and people online, it's an absolute privilege. I really appreciate it. And uh, weirdly, this is gonna uh, be my home from uh, March next year. So it's quite surreal being here as this was organized six months ago before I knew I was gonna be a professor here. So thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, look forward to hearing from all of you. Cheers, thank you. talked earlier about trends and language I, I i write i love language so that's always something that interests me and you know the language of anti-racism or the language of decolonization or the language of these terms that come up and then they get mainstream and then off they go so i always i often think about instead of what are you trying to remove or what are you trying to break down like what are you trying to build so if I had to ask you instead of using the language of the calling whatever that thing is like in your personal opinion what do you think and you don't have to ask this right now because obviously you, you talked about being put on the spot so that's not what I'm trying to do no, no, no. but I'm just curious you know thinking of it more in the language of like instead of what are you trying to remove like what are you then trying to build because I think sometimes if we get caught up in dismantling things without deciding what we're going to build something else springs up in its place and it may not be something that we actually want or desire or anything like that so that's my question to you personally please don't answer it right now if no, you don't no, want no, to I, but I, I yeah can, I, can, I can definitely try I mean um, if I was being absolutely um, honest um, so my, my heroine is bell hooks um, and pretty much everything that I've done has revolved around that notion of solidarity love and kind of pedagogy for empowerment um, across the intersection and the way that I, I, I've always envisaged what I would have in its place is this idea of kind of not non-disposable empathy so really being able to situate yourself and put yourself in someone else's shoes now you can make an argument that you can't experience that unless you've actually done it but that idea of sitting with someone I think goes a long way so you don't have to experience what they've experienced but sitting alongside them and holding their hand and that for me is situated in something more than just it's not just an act it, it, it it's basis it's 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 catalyst it's currency is love and i think that in these spaces the absence of love is something that i observed when i first came into academia under 10 years ago and I always felt that like a lot of Bell Hooks' teachings are a useful way to kind of, you know, people talk about collegiality and how you build that, but actually a lot of academia, if not all of it, is built on individualism. So you're, the more selfish you are, basically, the more, you know, the more successful you'll be. That's what you're encouraged to be. And I guess part of my belief is to reject that because as my dad says, the only concept that is colorblind is individualism. <laughs> and I think reject that for something that revolves around kind of solidarity, love, and finding ways to deal with the past, but recognize ways to think of how we conceive this brighter future. And I really do think that brighter future is conceived through different paradigms of love and how we express that with one another and how we engage in creating these kind of cultures and safe spaces. Um, that's my personal belief and, and one that I, I really hold dear and I've, I've tried to enact in the best way I could in, throughout my career in academia. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yes. So if you could just say your name when you say questions, yeah. that would be brilliant. Sorry, Hi, Jason. I'm Salma. Salma, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, so my question is, like do you have any thoughts as to how we can go about understanding what the effects of colonizing is when we're working with like colonial tools and resources and our thinking itself has been really shaped by colonialism it feels like how do we how do we dismantle the master's house when like all we have is the master's tools how do we get around that yeah, yeah i just want to yeah. see if you have any thoughts that's great that's a great question um I guess the thing with the master's tools is that um, 
as my dad would say, you always know what you can do, but you never know what someone else can do. And I think people underestimate people who have the master's tools. They're a lot more resourceful than people realize because they've always been in this state of survival. So they understand what they need to do to actually be able to get in the master's house in the first place. Once you're in the master's house, you can, you can, what rhymes with, you can buck things up, right? <laughs> um, so um, I was trying to think, I was saying, um, so you can, you can kind of do all of that. You can kind of do all of that. And I guess it's um, part of it is a reimagination of what, of what that space could be. Part of it is a reorientation um, of the problematic nature of these tools and how they've been used to um, systemically, historically, violently um, subjugate and subordinate people of colour over a period of time. And part of it is kind of really um, galvanising this understanding that this is never for the benefit of just black and ethnic minority and indigenous people. It's for the benefit of all global citizens um, in terms of trying to na navigate and circumnavigate the multicultural, multi-ethnic, multiracial global society. And actually, if we go back, if we strip this back, if we strip it all back, take all the horrible wallpaper off and we just get to the, to the bare kind of stone wall, what is actually the purpose of education? I think one of the fundamental remits of education is prepare people to take their place in society. And part of our job as custodians of whatever form of education we may sit in, in this case, the academy, is to prepare people as best as we can to take their place within society. And part of that is equipping them with the necessary toolkit to be able to not only challenge the master's house, but to be able to think about ways in which you can kind of loosen some of those screws and potentially put new ones in um, on what I believe is actually becoming a crumbling structure. I think the way we're talking about decolonizing now, that structure is not as firm as it once was, even though racism manages to reinvent itself, our approaches to dealing with racism are becoming more sophisticated as well. And we're beginning to recognize and see them for what they are. So I think in terms of dealing with that, those are all things to kind of keep front and center in our foci in terms of how we address those issues. Brilliant, thank you. There's a question online. Uh, I don't know how to see your name. If you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Amino and I'm currently a student at the University of Westminster in London. And I'm lucky to be an intern in the social pedagogies that um, deals with um, decolonization and diversification within the bioscience. And, and, and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to ask the questions. So Jason, so my question would be, and one of my uh, tasks is to create a reading list that addresses this um, decolonization, trying to encourage much more um, authors from around the world. And then you mentioned that um, that reading list isn't just part of it. And you mentioned that we are, instead of um, analyzing what is the problem, you're just finding a solution. Then, then you also mentioned like a tick box. So your so my question would be, what would be a a, a starting um, um, a starting step for one to attempt to address it and create an inclusive reading list as well as to address the whole, or not the whole, because like you said, it is a continuing evolving. It's like a kind of like every year there's a new form of racism. I mean, and, and my question would be, what would be a good way to start to address it? That's great. I've never concentrated so hard in my life because I'm looking at the <laughs> um, <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, so I, I guess um, one, one thing that's important to caveat, and thank you so much, um, Emil, for your question. One thing that's kind of important to caveat is that reading lists are a good way to start. But I, I, I guess it's about having something that really kind of punches through those layers of like colonization. And, and, part, and part of that is actually us having an understanding as to how we arrived in that in that place. So you can have um, you know books that can suffice to do that, but it's actually about thinking about curriculum design. It's about thinking about some of the mechanisms that currently exist in place. It's about thinking about the types of people that are actually conveying or the kind of um, I guess the conduits through which knowledge comes through. So people of color in that space, for example. 
it's about kind of thinking about industry, it's about thinking about all these kind of other tenets as to why they exist the way they do. Now, books are useful to an end, but what becomes really important is that there's a difference between having kind of surface level engagement, which I think reading lists and changing books and that kind of thing, it can do that, it can give you that surface level engagement, which allows you to be able to navigate those conversations with some uh, some semblance of confidence but actually addressing what the issues were i think that is hugely important and i think one of the best ways to do that is to actually one engage students in the historical aspects through curricula or through symposia or through seminars or through industry professionals or academics and there are ways to kind of do all of that in accordance with reading lists, changing libraries, changing all these setups as well. So I think a lot of these things are done as a one intervention thing. And what I guess I'm saying is that it needs to be multiple different interventions, all interacting and working cohesively at the same time to create something that actually one, recognizes the past and the challenges of the past in terms of the, in terms of the colonization aspect of it. And then two, the decolonizing aspect is really, again, that visionary piece of how do we move forward? How do we change that space? And I think it's just about how we recenter, or sorry, reorientate this idea of decolonizing. Because as I mentioned, there are no two people that have got the same idea of what decolonizing is. So by the way, I'm not saying that my, my conception is correct or right, but what I'm saying is that that is how I would advocate doing it. Because then I think, you know where you're go you you can only know where you're going if you know where you've been and if you know w what the actual context was then i think from that position you're operating from a position of strength to then decolonize i hope that makes sense and it feels weird talking this way when there's a room full of people but um, yeah <laughs> thank you so much oh no worries thank you thank you i think we've got time for one more question from the room before we get uh, hi, I'm Dan Barrick from uh, St George's University of London. Um, I hope my question doesn't come across as all lives matter because it's not meant that way. But the, the the modern world is the product of colonialism. I think you can say that, but it's not all rubbish. So how do we go about distinguishing, you know, what we want to decolonize versus what we and what do we do with the good parts of colonialism? I mean, you know, within the context of that, I meant the question, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, my mum went to St George's. Oh, that's good to okay. tell her. So, yeah, she graduated from there, yeah. Um, so I guess from, 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 from my point of view, um, The good parts of the colonizing is, is almost like someone asking me what are the good parts of gentrification? So my answer to that would be nothing. Um, yeah, um, so because yeah, I, I mean, for obvious reasons, I don't, I, I, there's nothing that I could, I would really endorse about the suppression of any group of people, um, whether it be black, white, Asian, you know, mixed race. I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't personally endorse that, and that's just my personal opinion. Um, but um, the first part of what you uh, mentioned. Um, which was wasn't what were the good bits. It was, it was almost. If I've got it right, please tell me if I've got it wrong. Like, um, it's not kind of throw the baby out with a bathwater, but yeah. One of the good things is scientists, things like the scientific. So, in the sciences, things like the scientific method, which yeah. is the product of of European, oh, yeah. um, you know study, mm. and it's you know it's very much a product of, of a colonial mentality yet it has worked for hundreds of years and it's produced benefits and how would we deal with something like that yeah no i i yeah i think that's a that's an absolutely valid point um I, I guess the emphasis on that is um is western and european um and i guess positioning that as the kind of axis of knowledge is the thing that i have a problem with um, because that axis of knowledge is not something that pertains to all global citizens in relation to the idea of race. And I'm not saying that you are, by the way. Um, so I, I think that that is the bit that I think it's important for us to challenge because um, 
westernized conceptions of medicine, you know, technology, engineering, mathematics, all of those science, all of those things, um, whilst they do benefit a large proportion of the of global citizens, citizens, there are new things that have emerged over the last 100, 200 years, which mean that that particular model is not actually fit for purpose in terms of supporting and also, I guess, um, facilitating a, a global society. So it, it, it's about really how, how we challenge that. And by the way, it has worked, but it, it's worked very much to the alignment of white people. And I, and I think that's a very important distinction to make. You know, so for example, if we look for, I don't know, if we take the, the human body, for example, and we look for particular signs um, on a body to show um, I don't know, having a particular type of skin cancer, let's just say, like it's a drastic example, but like, do those same symptoms come up on people with, you know, brown, darker complexions, mixed race? What, what would be the kind of implications that? And if we, if we situate it within that kind of Eurocentric ideal, we're basically going to look for the same markers that are on white people, on, on black and ethnic minority and indigenous people, which it just doesn't come up the same. So um, I guess that, that, that kind of, you know, taking that kind of construct off that axis and kind of thinking about that in a more modernized context that takes into consideration, I guess, the global majority is something that I would strongly endorse but I would also welcome that other people have different opinions and, and may reject that as a view. And we can still have an Ovaltine afterwards and, and some biscuits. It's, it's absolutely fine. Cheers, Norris. Nice. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone, for your, for your questions. And thank Can we just give Jason a round of applause for a really thought-provoking keynote uh, and for his responses to questions? I'm just going to borrow that.